All right. Quick, um, quick story here before we dive in. Just reminded me about Rush working the resource table back there. He, he can be a little bit motivated as a salesman because he gets 5% of sales. <laughs> and so, and the cute factor, like the, you know, the grandmas are always, oh, what a nice boy. And so, so years ago, again, my daughter, Lissy, a lot of stories about her. Uh, Lissy was with me for a, a whole day, you know, conference. And we're driving back to the hotel. She's 10 or 11 years old. And she's like, dad, can I talk to you about something? And I've just been talking about Christian parenting all day and building a heart connection with your kids. I'm like, honey, you can talk to your dad about anything. Absolutely. Well, dad, I need 7%. <laughs> There's no joke. Some guy during the conference had talked to her right about our business arrangement and said, 5% is unacceptable, young lady. You need to insist on a raise from your father. Doggone it. So she got 7%, needless to say. Okay. We are going to talk in this last session together about a vision for family worship, how to pray and read the Bible together as with the generations of your family, when the grandkids come over, when the nieces and nephews come over. How do we do this in a way that's not going to drive everybody nuts? How many of you grew up in a home that had regular family prayer or family Bible reading? Raise your hand for me if you grew up in a Put your hand up really high and everybody look around the room because we want to see you oddballs. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, now I got three kids raising their hands, which means they're growing up in a home like that. Well done. Pastor, your, your church is normal, and by that I mean not good. Um, 15%, statistically, 15% of church-going folks grew up in a home that had regular family prayer and regular family Bible. Okay. So one of the most recent studies that was done is 2005, and they found out that church-going folks, only 5% now were doing it. I mean, if only 15% grew up with it, right, that sounds like it's in decline. And of course, it, it was. Most recent study, 2020, from Faith at Home, found 20% church-going families had family prayer and family Bible in the home. And I absolutely believe that trend. This conversation we're having right now about parents and grandparents catching a vision for spiritual leadership in the home. This is a conversation the Holy Spirit is facilitating all over the world. It is a global reformation of family discipleship. Okay, And uh, uh, I'm just so excited about where this is going to take the gospel. See, God created the church and the family to partner together like two pedals on a bike to advance the gospel. And that's what the Lord is doing more and more right now. So here's what I'm going to do. You got your outline. I'm going to talk about a biblical foundation for family worship, a historical foundation for family worship, principles for family worship, and then we'll talk about the practice of family worship. So I'm going to talk fast. You're going to listen fast. Biblical foundation. Stacy, you're going to have to help me along here because who knows what happened to my clicker. First principle, the family is God's primary vehicle for the evangelism and discipleship of children. God created the family as the primary way a child is introduced to Jesus and helped to grow in their faith. We've been in Deuteronomy 6. We'll go back there. Next slide, please. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commands I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. And then speaking to parents, teach them diligently to your children. Stacy, keep cranking with me here. Family worship then is the engine that powers the family. Listen, the family is the primary vehicle of introducing kids to Christ. Family worship, that few moments of family prayer, family Bible with the kids and grandkids, that's the engine that powers the family. How many of you have ever had conversations with your kids about how things were different when you were growing up? You know? One of the big differences between our kids' world and our world is our kids have lousy cartoons on television compared to what we had. Amen? All right, picture, you all know what this is. Flintstones, there we go. And you remember their vehicles. Underneath there, I should add like a little video, but underneath there, their feet are on the ground, right? It's a, it's a human-powered car, surprisingly fast, if you remember the, the <laughs> cartoon. It did dawn on me as a teenager, I'm like, okay, if you're going to run everywhere you go, why carry a car? Because, but whatever, I don't think they were meant to think it through to that, that level. But it's a human-powered car. For the sake of my illustration, I want to suggest to you that most Christian families today 
our Flintstone families. They bring two things to the table to deal with all the problems in the home. Sibling problems, marriage problems, finance problems, in-law problems, addiction problems, you name it. They bring two things to the table. One, they bring good intentions. And two, they bring willpower. They mean well. I can guarantee you, anybody who comes to a parenting conference at a church on a Sunday afternoon has good intentions. You mean well. And I'll also bet you're really trying to be a good parent, be a good grandparent. Have you ever had a big, big family fight, big family argument, and you need to pull everybody together at the, the table to, to talk it all out, and people say, sorry, it's okay, sorry, it's okay. And then you end with your grand speech. Okay, everybody. We all just need to try so that this doesn't. Oh, you've been here. Now, let's back up. Why are we at the table? We're at the table because someone sinned. Someone did something wrong. Now, in my family, when one person sins, eight people sin quickly thereafter. But regardless, we're going to have a meeting. What's the point of the meeting? We just want less sin in the house tomorrow. Amen? That's why we're having a meeting. So in order to have less sin in the house tomorrow, how's that going to work? We all just need to try so that this doesn't... Good luck. You're going to use your good intentions and your willpower to sanctify yourselves? It's not going to work. That's, it's like, it'd be no different than just putting your car in neutral in whatever, an hour when we leave, and, and, and pushing your car home. It's going to take you forever to get anywhere. You're going to be exhausted all the time. I mean, you can get home, sort of, I guess, but you couldn't live your life like that. You see, your car's got an engine. And when it comes to families, it's a supernatural engine. It's these few moments of family prayer, these few moments of family worship. I want my kids to have faith. How are they going to get that? God says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need the Holy Spirit to supernaturally transform us. I, I, need, to, I need like a new heart as a dad. That's not going to come from good intentions and willpower. It's going to come from the transformation of the Holy Spirit. All right, historical foundation. Christians down through the centuries have talked very differently about family worship. I'm going to zero in on one. A couple more slides forward, if you would. I'm going to make sure I leave room for questions here. One more. Thank you. This is written in 1640 in Scotland. They were teaching visionary parenting classes in 1640 in Scotland. They didn't call it visionary parenting. They called it directions for family worship. Okay, how to pray and read the Bible at home without driving each other crazy. And this is what they wrote. I will translate the Old English as needed. The assembly requires and appoints ministers to make diligent search and inquiry, whether there be among them a family or families which neglect the duty of family worship. Sir, front row, what's your name? Max. Max. Sorry you're in the front row and I know your name. Church is going to send pastors and deacons to your house every now and then to double check that you're praying and reading the Bible with the kids. If such a family's found, not praying and reading the Bible with the kids and grandkids, the head of the family is to be admonished privately to amend his fault. Max, you got to be praying and reading the Bible with the kids. Oh yes, pastor. I'll start right away. Next slide. And in case of his continuing therein, still not praying and reading the Bible with the kids, he is to be gravely and sadly reproved by the session. You're going to meet with the leadership team of the church, and they're going to say, Max, you've got to be praying and reading the Bible with your children. If he's still found to neglect family worship, let him be for his obstinacy in such an offense suspended and debarred from the Lord's Supper until he amend. Max, we're taking communion this week, and you can't participate because you're under the discipline of the church. Max, leave me alone. Okay, I'm done. Um, look at this. They're doing church discipline for a lack of family worship in the home? We don't do church discipline for anything. And they're doing it for this. And people will say, well, that sounds very legalistic. All right. Legalism is adding human rules on top of the Bible or thinking that you're winning points with God with your good behavior, obeying the Bible's just Christian. You understand? 
Deuteronomy 6, Psalm 78, Ephesians chapter 6, Colossians chapter 3, Genesis 18, Joshua 24. Lots of commands in God's word for us to have a Bible open with our children in the home. Now, you might say, whoa, they're taking this too far. They're going a little crazy. I can explain to you, or they explain why they take it so seriously. Here's the way they say it. These churches, these Reformation churches, were radically committed to the global advance of the gospel. And they believed that the gospel began with the souls of the little ones. And the little ones were entrusted to mom and dad and grandma and grandpa in the home. And mom and dad and grandma and grandpa in the home were commanded by God to pray and read the Bible with their children at home. So in order to reach the world for Christ, we had to have family worship in each little home. They connected global missions with family worship in the home. So if a family wouldn't do family worship in the home, they would say, maybe you're not on board with the gospel. Maybe you're not even on board with the mission of our church because your faith, our faith starts in the house. Let's talk about some principles. Next, uh, family worship, one of the reasons why it's so powerful, it's the intersection of your two most important relationships, your vertical relationship with God, your horizontal relationship with family, intersect in these one, five, 10 minutes of family worship. Do you see that? Lord, we want to be right with you and right with each other. Next one. Family worship is not Bible class. I'm going to come back to this a few different ways because it is so important. Probably the most common question I get about family worship. Again, I have two kids married off the payroll, five still at home. So I've got 21 down to nine. People say, Rob, how do you do family worship for ages 21 to 9. What they mean by that is how do you teach content for 21 to 9? They view it as Bible class, where I have a syllabus and or a curriculum, and I'm trying to get content through. And they just don't see how I could teach a 21-year-old and teach a 9-year-old. How's that going to work? Well, that question doesn't really work for me. I don't know exactly how to respond to it, because what we're doing is not Bible class. We can all pray, we can all sing, we can all hear God's word read. Sometimes our conversations go old, sometimes our conversations go young, sometimes our conversations go nowhere. Sometimes I'm leading family worship and I get the sense my little congregation is eager to conclude. (laughs) I just my spider sense is just tingling there, right? And so I say, hey, are you guys ready to kind of wrap this up? Uh, yeah, Dad, it'd be good if we could wrap it up. Well, what do I do? If, I'm, if I sense my congregation's eager to conclude, I... No, I don't go longer. I conclude. <laughs> I, say, I say, hey, all right, no problem. Who wants to pray? You know, sometimes, sometimes family worship in my house looks like this. Kids, your dad's exhausted. Let's pray. God, help these children fall asleep fast. Amen. You're like, well, that's not very good spiritual leadership. No, it's not. It's all I have right now. <laughs> you understand? We've got this little, uh, Amy has a, what is it? It's a, it's, it's a modern proverb. It's, it's from G.K. Chesterton. It's on our wall. It's a little piece of artwork. It's like macrame or cross stitch or what is it? If you have like a little saying, what is that? What's macrame? I don't know. What? It's cross stitch? This doesn't have knots in it. It's like a thing on a wall. It's like a thing. Don't, don't get me sidetracked on macrame. I don't even know what that is. It's cross stitch. And on the thing, <laughs> macrame, on the cross stitch thing, it says, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. You're like, that's not right. I'm like, oh, yes, it is. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. See, here's how that affects our life and family worship. You see, the way family worship ought to be, let me tell you what good family worship is. First of all, in my family, it would be seven time. Seven time is me, Amy, five kids, and we are seven. We are home, and nobody's rushing off to this and rushing off to that. We got like a solid hour set aside, right? I've got an object lesson, a game for Rush, and he's gonna love this object lesson. And then we're not just playing a worship song on YouTube, like the kids are doing live instruments. We are playing, right, worship together. And then I've got my Bible reading prepared and a, a, a lesson that I want to share that connects with my older and connects with my younger. And that the Word of God leads us into such a deep time of repentance for our personal sins and prayer for one another and prayer for global missionaries. And then we wrap it all up with our catechism. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. That, my friends, is good family worship. Now, how often do I get that, what I just described? 
oh, you know what? You just moved back up my grace list because you were making fun of me about macrame a minute ago. And once a month, now over here, I heard what? Oh, once a year. That's also pretty good. But I also heard a zero. Somebody said, you never get that. That's a little closer. Um, I, I get what I just described biannually. Is that the every other year? That's twice a year? Semi-annually is the... I hardly... Stop. I hardly ever get what I just described. So here's what I'm trying to say. You see, if, if, if we're having family devotions, we're going to do it right and we're going to be ready for it and we're going to be all prepared. If that's the way you're going to do it, you're doing this once a year. You're doing this once every two years. Better for me to be late for work and scribble a proverb on a napkin and leave that on the kitchen table than do what I just described for you once every other year. You understand? If it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. poorly. It's okay. Let's go for it in the grace of God. All right. Um, I'm going to give you now, oh, maybe I have another principle. Oh, yeah. Okay. I have to discipline myself to do this in 60 seconds because this one could explode into more. Family worship prepares children for worship in the family of God. Children who have family worship in the home get their spirits practiced up for worship with their big family at church. They learn to pray with others. They learn to hear the word of God read and attend their heart to it. They, they learn to sing. And kids who don't have family worship in the home very frequently find this room a weird place to be. I got to stop because I get too excited talking about that. All right, let's talk about the practice of family worship. The practice of family worship, it should say page six down at the bottom and the practice of family worship uh, at the top of your page. Um, in a minute, I'm going to give you some very practical uh, suggestions, but I want to start with like an intense challenge. Out of my few hours with you this afternoon, this is going to be my most intense. So take a deep breath, sit up straight. Always going to be intense now. Here we go. Intense challenge for you regarding family worship with your kids and grandkids. Here it is. Start somewhere. You're like, I didn't seem as intense as you set that up. Um, Here's what I mean. This really came clear to me when I was in a counseling session. Uh, this was, I just recently had a birthday that rhymes with nifty. And <laughs> I was probably 10 years ago. And a couple from our church who then, they were in their, their 50s. I was about 40. They wanted to meet with me to talk about how do we get more spiritual life in our home. Now, this was a very um, mature Christian couple in our church. And I really looked up to them. I mean, they were older than me. They were older kids and, and things. But I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll meet to talk. So what I, what I always do with a family is to try to identify what do you have going on in the home right now by way of spiritual conversation and spiritual life and what's one small thing we can add. That's my approach. So I said, hey, let's talk about prayer. I assume you pray before meals. What other prayer do you have going on in the house? And the woman sitting in my office, she kind of, shifted in her seat a little awkwardly, and I picked up on something's wrong. So I said, hey, did I say something that made you feel uncomfortable? She said, well, you said you assume we pray before meals, and it's probably been like 10 years since we've done that. Serious Christian family. Somehow the enemy had wormed his way in there and kind of robbed them of this basic Christian practice of praying before meals. So what was Pastor Rob's grand challenge to them about the next step of family worship in their home? Yeah, how about we spend a few months winning that territory back again and getting that built back in? So they're walking out of my office at three o'clock that afternoon. And I want you to put yourself in the man's shoes. In three hours at dinner time, for the first time in 10 years, he's going to say, Hey, how about we pray before we eat? How's he feeling? Feeling nervous, insecure, inadequate, embarrassed, right? Where's all that coming from? Is it coming from his wife? Is it coming from God? No, what's it coming from? What's he dealing with? Resistance. Even walking out of the office, he's out of neutral and in first gear, right? And he's even just thinking about praying before dinner. He's already dealing with that resistance. So men, women, I'm repeating this for a reason. If you ask the Lord to help you accelerate into spiritual life in your home, you're going to get more resistance. 
recognize it, prepare for it. When you feel that anxiety and insecurity in your gut, that's your cue to say, aha, that's what Rob was talking about. This is the resistance that I'm dealing with and I'm blowing through it. I'm not gonna let anything slow me down. Okay, I'm gonna give you six elements of family worship. You have these as blanks on your handout. I'm gonna put them on the screen. Write these down. Activity, singing, Bible reading, discussion, prayer, and catechism. Activity, singing, Bible reading, discussion, prayer, and catechism. Now, this is super important. I know you're still writing, but pay attention. My message this afternoon is not, 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 when you sit down for family worship, thou shalt do one, two, three, four, five, six. That is not the message. I'm giving you six tools in a toolbox. Someday you're going to reach in and take out one and four. Other days you're going to reach in and take out five. Other days, do you understand? This is mix and match based on the day, based on the schedule, based on the kids, based on the grandkids, based on your bandwidth. I'm giving you six tools in your toolbox. Here we go. First one, activity. Some of the best family worship times in our house come when I put a little bit of preparation into an object lesson or an activity that connects with the scripture that we're going to talk about. And this is particularly the case for uh, elementary age kids or grandkids. Something physical, something hands-on. Now, here's my problem with this piece. I'm not creative, one. And two, I hate crafts. They paralyze me, right? You can teach your kids a great gospel lesson with popsicle sticks and glue. Well, I don't have that stuff. Well, it's right in the drawer over there. Yeah, too far. I, I'm just not, I don't know. I can't do it. So <laughs> raise your hand if you're like me. Okay, good. So I need, I need activities that, that are like lowest possible hanging fruit. So we do, uh, we do a lot of Bible charades in our house. Remember charades? So it's, it's think of a history from the Bible. We call them histories, not stories. Think of a history from the Bible that you want to act out, and we'll try to guess what it is. So Russia's older brother, Ray, he's 13 now. When Ray was younger, six, seven, eight, he was a really gifted uh, dyer. Like, oh, oh, oh. He'd die good. So Millie, his older sister, would say, oh, I got one, I got one, but I need Ray. Well you know somebody's going to die. So they go in the other room. They figure, you know, they, she tells them what Bible story they're going to do, Bible history they're going to do. They come out and she does something and she says, do it, man, do it. And he does his death scene. The problem is so, like from a charade standpoint, so many people die in the Bible <laughs> that it's hard. Like who is dying now here? Um, but that's fun. Okay, sometimes, um, sometimes I've done like little puppet shows. Okay, you're like, oh, okay, you're a puppet guy with a puppet theater. No, I have a sock and a coffee table. That's what I have. And I lay down under the coffee table, and I have a sock, and I act something out. Um, again, I, I don't do a ton of puppet shows, but I'll, I'll, I'll do one for you now. Would you like that? Yeah. All right, let's go. Um, oh, yeah, I can do this. Uh, no, way. no, 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 no. I, thank you. Okay, she says, do you need a sock? A little history there. Triggered. I don't, okay, I understand that I don't have my equipment, right? I don't have my coffee table. I'm going to use the piano, and I don't have a, a, a sock. I was at a family camp. Was it you that just said that? Who, what? Come on. No, 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 it was not. It was you. So I'm at family camp, and I, I'm sharing, I'm sharing this, this illustration, and a sock comes flying up on the stage. And I'm like, that's sweet. That's awesome. So I go and pick it up, and it's summer family camp. Oh, and it is just soaked and warm and wet, right? But, but, but I'm a professional. Do you understand? Unlike the microphone before. But I am a professional. So I keep it all together, and I do my thing or whatever. And then afterwards, this was like the mid-morning Bible teaching session. And uh, my wife's sitting right here. And so I come down. I say, hey, honey, you want to go to lunch? She goes, don't touch me. You put your hand in that filthy man's sock. Don't ever do that again. She didn't talk like that, but... Okay. So, um, I am going to act out a verse from the Bible. And you have to guess what it is. Now, 
If I had my equipment, it would be obvious that this is a dog. But I have to tell you because I don't have my sock. So I'm going to act out a verse from the Bible about a dog. Here we go. I know. I know. Talent. Anybody know the verse? Okay, as a dog returns to his vomit, you know the second part because that's the whole point of the verse. Huh? So a fool returns to his folly. Yeah. You ever seen a dog do this? Uh-huh. It's one of the most viscerally disgusting things that you'll ever see. But here's what I don't understand. Why do I keep watching? Right? He's eating it. Why don't I look away? But I'm like, ah! It's horrible. So God takes this universal experience that we've all had and says, just like a dog doing that, it's like a person going back and doing the same thing uh, over and over uh, again. Now, you might be here and you may be like, Rob, okay, I got puppet shows, I got charades. Like, I got a 16-year-old and an 18-year-old at home. I'm not sure it's going to really fly. Now, I did say these are ideal for elementary school kids, but there are some activities you can do with teenagers. You go to your 16-year-old, and and almost all the the good teenage ones involve fire. So you go to the 16-year-old grandson. You say, hey, you want to burn something with your grandpa? Um, I guarantee you he's going to say, yes. And you go burn it. (laughs) Do whatever you got to do. And then go to any passage in the Bible about fire. I don't care. Elijah and the prophets of Baal, uh, day of Pentecost, you name it. <coughs> oh. Or maybe, or do you just turn me off back there? The mute button doesn't work. Okay. I'm back. But yeah, Rushbow, you want to grab me a water right there, pal? Thanks. Um, oh, is that one contaminated? Or is it new? Oh, it's new. Okay. <laughs> filter it through a sock. It's disgusting. All right, I got to keep moving. Uh, singing, singing. Uh, how many of you sing in church? Like I- in here, you, you, you sing. Okay, yes, miss. I'm, l- tell me your name again. Yeah, yeah. Elise. Elise, good. Um, based on your previous comment, I thought you could help me with this. <laughs> Elise, you sing in, in church. Are you like worship team girl or are you down with the... Regular people with, okay, you know, just a moment, but, but I'm, you're not worship team. Yeah, yeah okay. So um, next Sunday, all right, let's say you're here, there's an open seat next to you. And in the midst of the singing time, a, a visitor comes in, a new person who you've never met before, and they, they choose the seat next to you. Would you still sing? Okay. I didn't set that up properly. It's not you, it's me. Stranger danger. You ever heard of that before? Unknown human. Next to you. You're telling me that you'd still sing out loud next to an unknown human. Off going, that's fine, but you're still going to sing. Wow. Very spiritual. Now, my question, how many of you are just like Elise that you would sing next to a total stranger here in church? Wowzers. Well done. And I believe you. By the way, you did great. You're perfect. Um, But as soon as I say, hey, how about singing at home? You're like, I don't know. That's going to be pretty awkward. (laughs) Like out in public with strangers, no problem. Home with loved ones. Yeah, no, we're not. We're not doing that. So now again, tools in the toolbox. You got 16 and 18 at home. I don't recommend going home tonight saying, we're going to start singing together. You got two, four, and six at home or the grandkids come visit. You say, we're going to start singing together. What do two, four, six say? Woohoo! Let's go. Listen, my favorite part of Christmas and Easter. Traditionally, Amy's mom has hosted the gatherings, and we have our, you know, we have church and we have food and all this. And at some point on that afternoon, Grandma's going to sit down at the piano, and everybody's going to gather around. I got a quick video from Easter. Go ahead and play that.
I'm in that room and I'm, I'm pinching myself. I grew up with one alcoholic grandmother that didn't know Jesus. My kids think that's normal. What, what else would you do? Christmas afternoon for 15, 20 minutes, Easter afternoon. Why, why wouldn't grandma lead the family, right, as a spiritual matriarch and have us worship Jesus? So much of what I want to share with you today, and I, I, this is in the visionary parenting stuff in, in, in spades, but it's so important to capture this multi-generational vision for your life. It's not just about, I mean, God uses these analogies over and over again of the cultivating and the sowing and the reaping. How many of you are here, I wasn't planning on talking about this, how many of you are here and you're the first generation Christian in your family? Okay. So God reaches into this family and, and grace of God draws you to Christ and now your family thinks you're a nutcase, okay? because you're completely going the opposite way. And they say you're, all, you're going the wrong way when in fact you're going the right way and they're all going the wrong way. And, and it's like you inherit, you look around your life and you look around your family and it's like the garden is nothing but rocks and weeds. And you feel like all you do is break up rocks and pull weeds. You break up rocks and pull weeds and where's the fruit? Like this is just absolutely exhausting. And if that's you, you have to have multi-generational vision. What if Jesus came to you and said, your purpose is to break rocks and pull weeds. Your kids are going to plant some seeds and your grandbabies are going to get some fruit. Would it change your attitude to breaking rocks and pulling weeds? Sure it would. You say, Jesus, give me strength, help me, and help me not to lose right this multi-generational vision for my life. Okay, where are we? Bible reading. Bible reading. First question I get is, how do you do this for lots of ages of kids? Because they have a Bible class mindset. Next question I get, do you have a curriculum? Do you have a guide? Do you have a book? Do you have a curriculum a guide a book? Uh, and we ask that because most of us didn't grow up like this. And so we, we would benefit from a, a help, right? And, and some assistance. And so I'm going to give you a, a real small answer and a real big answer, okay? Uh, yeah, we have some curriculums. We write family worship guides through books of the Bible, this one's our family worship guide through the book of Genesis. And what we do is we give you every week activity, songs to sing, scriptures to read, questions to talk about, prayers to pray, catechism, toddler stuff, teen stuff. And it's just, hey, you look at it, you know, oh, that's dorky, that's dorky. Oh, we could do that. Okay. So it's just a Swiss army knife of, of stuff. Um, who wants this one as a free gift, by the way? Family worship guide. What's that? Oh, okay. All right. You know what? You were so good and I picked on you. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. And I had talked to someone else. The lights are in my face about getting you a copy. So make sure that uh, I get that to you right later. Um, also, so we have the, these two here with us. And I know a lot of you will want the print one, but I can get, you can get a free ebook of the Genesis worship guide. You have to write this down by going to visionary, go to our, go to our website, visionaryfam.com. I think it's at the bottom of your sheets. Yep. Go right to the bottom of your page and just put slash grace, visionaryfam.com slash grace. That will take you to a page that you can download the family worship guide through the book of Genesis, free PDF. If you want the print version, Rush can, uh, can get that for you uh, afterwards, okay? So listen, hear me. So Rob, do you have a curriculum? Yeah, we've got curriculums. We've got things that will, will help you. And I'm sure if you ask your pastors, they can get you some too. But I want you to forget all about that and let me give you the real curriculum. Here we go, ready? Take your Bible, open it, read it as if it were the very words of God and that you believed it with all your heart. You want your kids to have faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's living, active, sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating soul and spirit, joint and marrow, judging the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. People say, when do we start family worship? As soon as you find out you're pregnant. As soon as you know that you are a father or a mother. It's not, you're not going to be a father. You are a father. You are a mother. God's made the baby. Baby's with us, right? And so, and, and I remember Amy, when we had little infants, and she's doing this with our granddaughter now. She'll put, you know, AV on a, a, a little granddaughter on her 
blanket and she can't go anywhere. She doesn't crawl yet. And Amy will just kind of read the Bible to her. And you'll be like, well, why is she reading the Bible to a seven-month-old? Bible says she's not going to understand anything. No, she's not going to understand anything. But it's not Bible class. The Word is living and active, penetrating soul and spirit, joint and marrow. The Holy Spirit's ministering to that little girl in a way that I can't even explain to you. Okay, activity singing, Bible reading discussion. Discussion. We're going to talk about what we just read. We're going to ask two questions. What truth do we learn from the passage? How does that truth apply to our lives? Sometimes our conversations go old, young, nowhere, relax. It's okay. You're not trying to get through curriculum. You're not trying to get through your book or your content. Relax. Heart connection and warmth are so critical in this family worship time. If this is Bible class without heart connection and warmth, I dare say you may even be doing more spiritual harm in the long run than you are spiritual good. Prayer. One of the best ways to get prayer going is with high-low. We do this at the dinner table. Hey, what was the high part of your day today? What was the best part of your day? People go around and share. By the way, we don't ever make people share. We don't ever make people pray. Guilt-free. You want to share? Share. You want to pray? Pray. It's all good. Sometimes I don't want to share. Sometimes I don't want to pray. It's all right. But what was the best part of your day? Sometimes people share. Hey, would anybody be willing to pray and thank God for what we just heard? How about your low? What was the hardest part of your day? Well, I had this, and I had this, and I had this. Hey, thanks for sharing that. Um, could it, someone pray and ask for God's help with those hard things that we just heard? High low is so good because in our busy, crazy families, so many highs and so many lows go by that don't get shared we don't even know what's going on in each other's lives. And it's a built-in opportunity for thanksgiving and a built-in opportunity for prayer uh, and asking, um, asking for God's help. Okay. Uh, I am going to push pause on catechism. And I'm going to be coming back around with a concluding story in a few minutes. But I'd rather pause there to take questions, comments, thoughts, and disagreements. And depending on how all that goes, um, if you want, if you say, Rob, tell us about catechism, I'd be happy to. Uh, but I'll leave, that, I'll leave that up to you. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned you don't require anyone to pray or participate. <coughs> Do you require them to be present? And at what point, if there's someone who is being very negative? Okay, you don't require them to share or pray, but do you require them to be present? And particularly if they kind of have a really, really bad attitude, is it potentially a discipline issue? Uh, hypothetically, for your friend's kids, how old of a child are we talking about? What? 17. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Um, as a general rule, in the Reno house, we would require you to be there. The older you get, 16, 17, 18, 19, there are sometimes schedules and deadlines and pressures on those soon-to-be adult kids um, where I will, I even think about my freshman and high school daughter right now, who is in a really crazy, you know, season. Um, and it was just the other night. I said, honey, we're going to do family worship time. Um, I know how swamped you are. Um, if it works for you to join us, that's great. But if you just feel like you can't, it's okay. Now I'm able to say that to her because the overall environment for her spiritually, like I know if she was not swamped and stressed, she'd be there. And it'd be okay. So it's very, it's easy to have, right, that kind of flexibility. But if you have a child, uh, a teenager that is bristly, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, that it's not just they're swamped and stressed, that they, they're really not interested in being there. You don't have a family worship problem, right? You've got a spiritual issue and potentially a relational issue. So that's the priority to press into. The priority is not how do I get that kid's rear end on the couch during family prayer. The priority is finding out what's going on that the kid doesn't even wanna be at the family prayer even if they can be. So the deep dive on that, you know, as far as our resources, are, is that book, Five Reasons for Spiritual Apathy in Teens and What Parents Can Do to Help. We won an award for that book, longest title. I was very <laughs> proud of that. Um, uh, no, but, but that's an attempt to try to get underneath, right? It's not uncommon for teenagers to be spiritually apathetic. That's blah, whatever, disinterested. The question is, is why, right? What's, what's going on under that? And that's what we want to dive into. So I hope that's helpful. Yes, please, in the back. 
Microphones on the way. Um, I, my husband and I, um, also actually we don't come to this church, um, but we came. I we heard about you because I follow your podcast, oh, um, that makes and you happy. so, <laughs> and um, it since we first have kids, our, we've ha- had them with us, and I've just been a firm believer to keep them in service with us. Um, And so we've been doing this at the church that we were going to, and and we would take the kids every once in a while to class, to children's church. Um, But then we heard one of your podcasts talking about biblical, were kids in service or not? And that really put, like, gave us... Like, we were questioning, should we be doing this or not? Um, Because it kind of seemed like it was, it it was looked down on where we're, where we're currently at. And um, so the question is, so, so when we heard your podcast, we're like, that's true. And it confirmed what we were doing was right. And uh, so my question is, how do we navigate that (laughs) in, in the, and being in church and maybe not having. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, Dustin, can you, uh, so that I'm helpful, not hurtful, kids on Sunday morning here, how does that all work? We have kids' church from, uh, like they'll leave after our worship service. Okay. Before, oh. The kids will leave uh, 